Hello, this is Stuart Nakbar with Educated Quest. Today I'm with Drew Schradel. He is the Director of Admissions at Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa. Now I've done a little homework about Cornell. Mount Vernon is a small town, but it's quite close to larger cities like Cedar Rapids and Iowa City. It's also close to the famed Field of Dreams. Uh, in baseball uh, from, from, the, from the movie that Kevin Cosner starred in, but also the, my hometown, New York Yankees, will be playing the Chicago White Sox on that very field. But that isn't the reason I wanted to learn more about Cornell. Um, Cornell is famous um, for operating under what's called a block plan, where students take one course at a time. In fact, that's what Cornell College calls it. And Drew and I are gonna talk a bit about Cornell and about the block plan. And we hope that you enjoy this discussion and learn more about this very interesting uh, college in, the, in, in Iowa. Drew, thank you for joining me today. Hey, my pleasure. And just before us, you're talking about you're not coming to Iowa, but I'm a huge Chicago White Sox fan. So maybe you and I can meet the Field of Dreams and watch that game between the, the Sox and the Yankees. and the, We'll get you back into Iowa at some point in time. We'll be we'll be watching that game. We like we'd be watching a little league game together. There's some, <laughs> there's some few seats there from the pictures that I saw, and we also have to be lucky enough to be selected to get tickets. So, if that happens, I look forward to coming. Sounds good. But briefly, can you tell us what makes Cornell stand out from other colleges that students consider the most? Yeah. I mean, you, you nailed it when you uh, did the introduction. It's the, the one course at a time block plan. Um, you know, it's, it's so unique in, in how it works and how students get the opportunities that, that the block plan provides. Um, it allows for smaller classroom experiences. You know, we cap every class at 25 students. Average class size is typically 16. So you're not looking at giant classrooms. You're not looking at lecture halls. The classes are a lot more hands-on, conversation, discussion-based. Um, you know, I think back to some of the professors who say, you know, it's if we lectured for uh, four hours a day, uh, every day for 18 days, everybody would fall asleep and, and nobody would learn anything. And so they have to get creative with it. There has to be more opportunity to get in the lab, uh, to do research, do fabrication for our engineering program, uh, to, to do teaching, to, to get in the athletic facility for kinesiology. And so those opportunities really add up. And it gives our, our professors actually a lot more freedom as well, because when you don't really have a time constraint, our professors can get really creative in how they decide to teach a certain subject. And so I think the block plan and all those attributes it adds are really the reasons why Cornell stands out as a unique and different institution. So a block is for one class, Four day, four hours a day, five days a week. Monday yeah, through so Friday. It's, it's, yep, one class for eighteen days, Monday through Friday, for about four hours a day, and so that can vary. It just depends on what the course decides on, and again, this is where the flexibility comes in. If professor thinks that, hey, you know, I can I can teach a course for two hours, then the other parts of the day are better for the students to go back to their room and and do something. Uh, a writing assignment or, or something. They can choose to do that. But uh, typically a class will be about four hours a day. We split it up from nine to 11 and usually one to three. And then three o'clock is actually the cutoff. So we don't have night classes or anything like that. At three o'clock, classes are, are scheduled to end campus wide. And that really gives our students the opportunity to be what I like to say, the other half of the college student so not just the academic side, but then kind of developing who that person's going to be, whether that's in clubs, organizations, fine arts, or athletics, um, that allows students to be involved and not have to worry about the kind of the constant battle between uh, maybe your passions in your, your outside life and, and your passions for your academic and what you want to go on and do as a, as a career. And a block can be in a normal time um, on campus in a classroom, but it could also be elsewhere. Like it could be in another country or it could be a study away in another city. Yeah. 
And so the block allows our students to travel abroad if they like. We can travel off campus. So we have a lot of different courses that are, are typically a, a very popular course. So, you know, from the, the closer ranges, uh, Cornell is pretty centrally located, which is, is unique for us. And we also have really good access to major highways, um, including Iowa 80. And so we're about two to, to six hours away from uh, Chicago, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Omaha, Kansas City, Des Moines. So we have a lot of different access to, to large metro areas. And so some of the off-campus courses we do are we go up to the Boundary Waters or a really popular one for theater students is we go to Chicago and do 30 plays in 30 days. Uh, and so we, we go every day for the block and we go all the weekends and we are able to go to all these different plays and, and enjoy them and we get to go behind the scenes and we contact some of our alums who are working for different things and they go uh, backstage and do um, you can see some of the wiring. So we had a, a, a alum that worked on Wicked and they got to see the harness equipment and how they make people fly. So we get really cool opportunities there. Uh, we've also gone to Chicago for so, uh, sociology classes, but then we can go abroad. We can go larger trips. We have business classes that have gone to China. Uh, we have an art uh, history class that goes to Rome and studies the architecture there. And then we have our probably our most popular course that everybody gets jealous about, which is our biology course that goes to the Bahamas or Belize every February. Um, and, and so the uniqueness about that is not even just so much the course and, and allowing our students to only focus on that one course when they study abroad, but there's also some other benefits to it. One of them being that we try to find times when it's an off travel time. So it's a little bit cheaper uh, on some of those flights. And the other thing too is, is people listening to this might know schools that have like a J term, January term or a May term. Those are really popular times where semester schools kind of do a one block experience. But a lot of schools have those. And so the example is for our Bahamas course, we travel to an island that is popular among a lot of institutions. And they all go in January. And so it's a very small island and a very small research facility that all these different schools have to share because they're all there on their January term and this is the only time they get to go. Well, well I always say when that very overcrowded boat is on its way out mm -hmm. from the Bahamas, our very lightly crowded boat is on the way in. And we get that whole island and the research facility all to ourselves. And it allows our students to all have the opportunity that maybe not every student in those January term classes get. When you're on that island versus being in Chicago or on campus, is the nine to three a little different? You yeah, don't... it's good. Yeah, it's a little bit different. But I think, you know, the students like that because it's, you know, the, the nine to three in the classroom is going to be, you know, it's going to be a classroom setting. Um, you know, there's still things you're doing with lab work and whatnot. But I think when you get out into the, the field and, and you go to Chicago or you go to the Bahamas, I think our students are a little bit more willing to, to work a little extra time. But that doesn't mean they don't have fun. Um, you know, if you're scuba certified, uh, our, our professor who goes to the Bahamas will, will take you scuba diving. And, um, you know, there's definitely time to, to be able to go run around the beach. And, and actually, a cool thing is, in the past, we've taken other courses down to the Bahamas with our biology course, and they've gotten down, sat together, and talked. So we had an anthropology class that went with our Bahamas course, and there's actually there's plantations on this island. And so our anthropology course went out and studied these plantations. They got back, and they sat down, they talked about you know this with the biology course, and they might find something cool that kind of connects the two things together. So there's a lot of, of different cool things they can do. and. Um, a lot of fun, I think, that they have as well. Can internships run in tandem with a block or actually be a block? They can, yeah. And so internships are, are definitely something that, that students can do during a block and, and only do that internship during the block uh, if they'd like, or they can also work in tandem. So I've had students who have worked for our tour guide program who have been pre-vet and uh, they did an internship at a veterinary clinic just north of Mount Vernon where Cornell is located. And they did it while they were a student, while they were in the classroom. Uh, you know, 
timing wise, it's going to be a little bit different because you're going to be in class and you get out of class. And there's going to be maybe only a couple, a few hours that you can do the internship. But you can also say, hey, I'm going to take an internship for a whole, a whole block. Uh, and in that point in time, you say, you know, block three, I'm going to do an internship somewhere. Uh, and you can do that. And we've actually encouraged internships a little bit more. So we actually reimagined the liberal arts at Cornell College here recently. And a big part of that is what we like to call ingenuity in action. And that's where we encourage students to do two different areas of, of ingenuity. That could be civic engagement or service. It could be creative expression. So it could be your a theater, or art major, global connections, leadership, uh, professional exploration where the internship part really uh, is involved or research and where students will do a research project with a professor or something. And we ask students to do two of those different things uh, to complete their, their liberal arts education at Cornell College. And then once you do that, along with the other courses and everything, all of our students put together a portfolio. And then at the end of the year, they can really see how the liberal arts influenced their education. And so when they go to job interviews or they apply to jobs, they can explain, you know, yeah, I'm a biology major. I took an art course, but this is why that art course was so important to my biology degree. And so again, internships are an integral part into our ingenuity in action and our reimagining of the liberal arts. You bring up an interesting point, particularly with the student working at a veterinary clinic, um, the health professions and ed education are two professions where students who expect to enter the field or go on to graduate school have to do certain numbers of hours in a clinical or a volunteer or a practicum kind of setting. And so do most of the students do that to fulfill credits or do they just do that outside the block and try to manage their schedules to, ha to acquire those hours? Yeah, for, for the pre-med, the pre-professional programs in the medical field, um, it'll depend on the student. It, you know, if a student brings in certain credits, they may take it just for a block and, and just solely focus on that one block doing that. Um, some students may do it during classwork if, you know, say, especially athletes um, will sometimes try to do that during blocks um, throughout the year and they won't take a single block off to focus on it. And sometimes students do a combination. Sometimes students really love doing the internship and they'll continue it after they take that block where they only focus on it. As far as uh, education goes, it's actually a part of our, our curriculum. So students will take three to four blocks where they'll purely student teach and that's all they'll do for those blocks. Uh, and so that's actually built into the, the curriculum for our education department. What, what makes a Cornell student uh, stand out to go through a schedule where a class is that intense for 18 days? So students who succeed really well are students who are constantly curious, who want to learn, who want to keep pushing forward. We became test optional five years ago prior to kind of everybody else being test optional because what we saw was that test score was an okay indicator, but GPA was a much better indicator of success at Cornell. And the reason for that was because GPA showed how hard a student wanted to work. And if, if a student worked hard and can show that in, in their classroom work, the course selection they took, their, you know, their grades in those courses, that was a, an indicator that a student could be successful on the block and that they could come and take these a little bit more intensive courses. We also get students who, who just like to focus on one thing. Um, you know, it's sometimes one course time is, is misconstrued as, as easier, right? Well, I focus on one thing, so it must be easier. Uh, and that's not really the case. Um, that's not to say that it can't be better for students, but the courses are, are, are intense, as you said, and, and they, they are demanding, they demand quick work. Um, you know, you don't have two days between assignments where you might, on a semester school, uh, you have one day, uh, and you may have to read a little bit more in that one day to be prepared for that next day. And so it's just, you know, students who are dedicated, students who want to come, who want to do the work, um, and, and for some students, it, it's just a better focus. Um, if you struggle in high school right now where you have seven different courses and you find all of them interesting, but just trying to 
balance between English and math and foreign language. And, you know, if you're like me, math and foreign language are the same subject. They're both foreign language. You know, it's, it's hard to focus on those things. And so if, if you do better when you have the opportunity to, to dive in and, and really focus, then I think those are good students as well. Cornell has general education requirements like other liberal arts schools, right? Like mm -hmm. you have to take math, you have to take a science, maybe a language, social science, uh, no matter what your major is. Mm -hmm. um, is. Does the block work for a student who all of a sudden has to take a gen ed in the subject that they're weakest at, that doesn't have a it, lot to do with their major? It does, yeah. And, and so... You know, there's a lot of different options that students can take, and, and one option in particular that I can think back on is, um, and I, I think we still offer it, but I'm, I haven't seen it in a couple of years, so maybe we don't, but we used to have uh, math for poets, and so <laughs> it was a writing intensive math course, right? Oh, and, and so the writer's dream, you don't have to worry about that analytical side of the brain that's only math, you, you had a writing intensive math course. And so we do try to offer a lot of different opportunities for students that when you take a general education course, you can find something that is a little bit more up your alley. Does that mean you're going to love every single course? Students don't love every single course, no matter what school they go to. You're always going to find that one course where you're like, you know what, I'm just not feeling this course. We do offer a three-day um, kind of grace period for students to decide whether or not they like a course or not too. So if you thought, like me, we talked about this before the interview is, you know, born and bred Iowan. I wanted to learn about Iowa where I went to school. I took history of Iowa. I thought this is going to be great. It's about as interesting as you'd think the history of Iowa was. Uh, and, you know, I, I took it and it was fine. But realistically, if I was on the block, I probably would have found out in three days or one of, one of the three days that it maybe was not the right course for me and I would have switched to a different course. And so you have that opportunity to switch to a different course within the first three days uh, and, and find something that's maybe a better fit for you. And in the long run, if after three days they tricked you and day four you come back and then you realize that maybe it's not right for you, in 18 days, you know, it's, I would say it's done over with. You can sit down, you can focus on that one course, you can get it over with and say, you know, I'm never taking pottery again. I can't, I can't make a pot. <laughs> how, many, how many undergrads go to Cornell? So just over a thousand. So this year we had about a thousand and two, I believe. And so we're right around that thousand mark and, and looking to, to grow a little bit more. How, how long and how many freshmen? So this past year we had about 315. Uh, we typically get anywhere from 320 to 330. Um, and so that's usually the average uh, class size of a, a first year class coming in. And do the, do our, when students are comparing the block plan against a more conventional uh, semester schedule, um, is that the thing that makes them say yes? You know, I think it's, it's definitely a, a reason for them to say yes. Um, I think it's, it, there's a lot of different things that come into it. Um, the, you know, obviously just the, the feel, the campus, the meeting with a faculty member um, and having that connection. Um, but I think students apply to Cornell because of the block plan. And so it's very rare that you encounter a student who applies to Cornell um, not because of it and, and doesn't have some interest in what the block plan provides. And so I think that's definitely a, a, a pull toward Cornell away from a traditional plan if you applied to both. Uh, but I think it's really the, the all-encompassing things. It's the, the relationships you build. It's the faculty members you meet with. It's the, the major that you want. Um, you know, it's, it's the building, it's the town, uh, it's all those different feelings uh, that, that build up inside of a student. So when, you know, they tell the admission officer, hey, I just feel like Cornell is the right place. Um, it's always hard to describe, but I think it's, it's a combination of all those things that we can provide. How are uh, fall admissions for this class impacted by the pandemic? Yeah. So it, you know, as far as a first year domestic student goes, um, we didn't see too much of an impact. Um, thankfully, we did see a lot of students who, who deferred uh, and are choosing to either come this semester or depending on how they're feeling about this semester, we're, we're allowing to defer even till the fall uh, of 2021. Uh, 
where we saw the greatest impact was really our international population, um, just with a lot of different things going on, and, and including COVID. Uh, we saw a lot of our international population either defer for a year or or have to you know pull their deposit to to Cornell um, just because it, they weren't going to be able to to get to the country. Uh, but overall, we found that our numbers were fairly good, and and this year we're we're seeing really great increased numbers, and so uh, we're happy to see that that we're able to adapt um, the right way. Is your office receiving questions from parents and students? or prospects that not, they would not have asked if there was no pandemic? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's it's definitely interesting. You know, we, at the beginning of the year, and I think most admission offices probably get these reports from different vendors, but we had a lot of reports that said that safety had gone from like the number four concern from a parent to the number one concern of a parent this year, and rightfully so. I mean, there's obviously a lot going on with, with COVID-19. Um, you know, we get questions about, you know, what happens if, if you have an outbreak on campus? What happens if a class get, gets canceled? Uh, you know, do you contact the parent? Uh, where, you know, where's the nearest um, hospital? Uh, how are you handling that? You know, uh, financial aid is obviously a, a huge, huge question this year, um, just depending on what happens to the, the parents and what happened to them through, through the beginning of COVID. And so we get a lot of those questions, but we get a lot of the same questions too. Um, you know, I think the one thing I've also heard is that this, this incoming class, the class of 2021, incoming 2021, uh, really does not see themselves as the COVID class. They really wanna try to make things as normal as possible. And while they're probably being affected more than the class that graduated last year, uh, you know, we're seeing that is that students really want to come to campus and they want to experience it and not have to worry about being considered that COVID class. They they want to be treated that just like any other student would in any other normal year. Did um, Cornell need to do anything to de-densify the residence experience? Yeah, so we didn't. Um, we we really were on top of things and a big shout out to to our COVID response coordinator who was actually our, our school nurse. She was set to retire uh, that past year. And, and she was so great when, when we asked her to come on to handle everything with COVID. Uh, she stayed on as our COVID response coordinator. And we really thought it out through the year, through the summer, and tried to figure out the best way of, of doing things. And uh, we were able to still have students have roommates. We felt that from a psychological and emotional point of view uh, through residents, um, residential living, that having roommates was really important. And, you know, we took all the precautions we needed to. We have masks for our students. Our facilities program, our facilities office was able to create um, fan filters for all of our classrooms. And uh, we have not seen widespread um, widespread uh, outbreaks um, or community spreading at all. Uh, we have no cases uh, as far as, as now that are related to classroom exposure. Uh, you know, we have had little bitty spikes here and there um, from just students getting together. Uh, we've had to implement some different um, guidelines to make sure that we keep our students safe, but uh, we've been lucky to have pretty minor cases. We were able to get students into a, a quarantine zone where they could uh, quarantine by themselves, and we were able to feed them with our food services. And overall, I think it's been a, a really good experience for the, the difficulties that it brings. Did the dining experience change? Um, it did. Yeah, it did change. You know, we, we really stopped letting people from the outside come in and eat. We, we allow people from outside, uh, including visitors, to come eat, and, and we stopped that. Uh, we had designated meal times as well. So depending on the okay. class that you were in, we, we really had students keep that. Um, and then anything that was self-serve for students, uh, we, we had people serve to them. So uh, that was really the biggest change. As far as the food and stuff like that, it, you know, still good and still plentiful for the students, but uh, we try to keep the dining fairly fairly scheduled to just keep everybody distanced. Because I've seen like campuses where they did open and there was glass walls and you'd look at, it would be like looking at the person across from you through a window. Yeah. 
Yeah. Did you yeah, have we, to... we didn't have to do that, or at least not to my knowledge. Um, Cornell, one thing I, I learned about Cornell before today is that there was a number of scholarships that students could be considered for. Can you walk me through some of those? Sure. Yeah, I mean, our, our main scholarships are our merit scholarships. And so we're pretty, we're pretty easy as far as the merit scholarships go. We don't make students jump through a lot of hoops to get those. Uh, if you apply and you're accepted, you'll receive a merit scholarship through, through Cornell College. Our scholarships range anywhere from twenty to thirty-four thousand dollars. So we have a twenty, a twenty-four, uh, a twenty-eight, a thirty-one, a thirty-four thousand dollar scholarship for, for out-of-state students. Then we have what we call our Iowa Promise Scholarship for our in-state students. Uh, that's a thirty thousand dollar scholarship um, for for Iowa students who are accepted. And so those are the main scholarship areas. And then we have fine arts um, scholarships as well. So students who are interested in music, theater, dance, or art. Uh, can audition or put a portfolio together to receive a, a fine arts scholarship and those could be upwards to um, additional funds that would would cover your full tuition um, and and those are the, the main scholarships that that we offer outside of a legacy for anybody who has a parent grandparent or great grandparent that attended Cornell now would most of the students that, that who come do they come from Iowa or do they come from outside the state yeah, so actually uniquely, only about 20% of our students come from in-state and 80% of our students come from out of state or out of the country. And so while Iowa is, is our most populated and popular state to get students from, um, Minnesota, Colorado, and Illinois, especially the Chicago area, typically round out the top four. And then usually it's Wisconsin and California of all places that actually battle it out for that fifth spot. So we're, we're a really diverse campus when it comes to location. We don't, we don't really pull strictly from the Midwest. Uh, and again, you're, you're not gonna see only people from Iowa. Um, you know, I always tell students, you can line 10 people up and you, know, only, you ask them and only two of them are gonna be from, from Iowa. Uh, and I think that's pretty unique uh, from a, in a small liberal arts college um, in the Midwest to, to have such a unique diversity. And everyone lives on campus. They don't move so them. most students live on campus. Yep. So about 92% of our students live on campus. Um, of the 8%, you have students who either live close enough within our, our distance halo that they can, they can drive into campus um, every day, or they're seniors and they might get off campus. But uh, it's pretty rare for students to get off campus. Most students will live on campus all four years. And, and there's enough activities to, even with the pandemic, there's been enough activities to keep people together. Or has it been difficult for clubs to meet? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely been different for clubs to meet. And, you know, there's certain clubs that, that have the ability to meet um, more easily that maybe aren't as physical or, or in person. Um, certain other clubs or organizations that are a little bit more in person and physical have had some, some difficulties. You know, we've been able to, you know, early on, blocks one and two uh, were a little bit um, easier. Block three is, is kind of where we had a little bit more of a, a spike as it got colder here. Uh, students kind of retreated more inside. There was less ability to do stuff outside. And so we, we had a little bit more virtual option um, that, that third block. Um, and then now we're in block four. Uh, after Thanksgiving, we gave our students the option that they could come back or they could do hybrid courses, online courses online um, from, from their home. And a lot of students have chosen to stay home just in the sense of winter break was right there, um, right after Thanksgiving, the amount of travel, you know, do you want to come back for one block, um, especially with, with COVID and risk possibly not being able to, to go home for winter break. So uh, we've been able to keep it pretty, pretty entertaining, um, but it's definitely something that we're learning and, and continue to, to try to get better. Are there summer and winter blocks too? So we offer, uh, two summer blocks or flex blocks. Um, we don't offer any winter blocks. So you have four blocks first semester and four blocks second semester. And then we have uh, a block nine and 10 over the summer. And these are, are flex blocks for a couple different reasons. So if you get through all eight of your blocks, no problem. You can take blocks nine and 10 um, at additional cost and possibly graduate early. Or if any of your courses were disrupted by COVID-19 and you weren't able to finish a block or a block got canceled because of, of a professor having it or something, 
uh, we would offer blocks nine or 10 uh, to students at no additional cost to be able to take those courses and still be on track to graduate on time. Are the schools that Cornell students have considered, are they typically other smaller colleges or are they other like state, the, the state university in their state or something else? Yeah. So we're pretty unique in that sense, too, is we don't really have any main competitors um, that, that we lose a significant number to. Um, you know, we see a lot of cross apps with the University of Iowa, the state institutions and in state. Um, you know, there's a lot of name recognition there and, and, and rightfully so. Iowa's a great institution. Uh, but we do see some cross app from, from universities. And then, you know, small liberal arts colleges. Iowa has a plethora of small liberal arts colleges. I would say you can close your eyes and throw a dart at the map of Iowa and you're probably in a town or city that's got a small liberal arts college. Um, you know, and there's a lot of great options in state, but you know, we, we're part of different organizations, CTCL, uh, colleges that change lives. Um, you know, well, we see a lot of cross apps with those institutions just from um, students looking to, to go to different institutions doing different things. Um, and we see a, a handful of small liberal arts colleges in you know, Minnesota or Wisconsin that students are looking for. So it really just depends on the student and kind of what they're looking for. Is there any particular academic program that kids choose more often than others? So uh, we just did a, a very large um, project on campus where we added one of our first brand new buildings uh, in quite some time, our Russell Science Center that houses biology and chemistry. So our, our pre-med program is a pretty popular program, especially because of that. We've seen some growth there uh, and also our engineering program. Uh, so we actually just got uh, accredited uh, for uh, ABET accreditation for our engineering program. And we have a Bachelor of Science there. We've seen some rather large growth with that. Uh, and we actually renovated our old science building where biology and chemistry used to be, to be our physics, math, uh, computer science and engineering building. And so we have a great new fabrication lab for our engineering students to be able to, to build and test different things. And so those are, are some of the more popular ones. Psychology is a very popular one as well. Uh, we do a lot of great research with um, our psychology program that students um, usually move forward with. Has the engineering program graduated uh, students? So we have graduated some students, yep. And so uh, in order to be ABET accredited, we actually had to graduate our first class. And so we graduated our first class of engineering students two years ago. And then last year, we had our full year review of our ABET accreditation. And then uh, this past year, or this year, we got uh, accredited with that. Um, and I should add too, our, our business and engineering, our business and economics program is also really popular including uh, we just signed a, a new agreement with the University of Iowa that okay. students who take our economics and business program at Cornell and graduate uh, with a 3.25 GPA uh, at Cornell will have um, preferential uh, acceptance into the Iowa uh, finance master's program, which is a three semester program. So we do try to, to make some, some agreements with different institutions like that as well. With the uh, just going back to engineering for a moment, that, that's yeah. like a general engineering program as opposed to specialties like electrical, mechanical, civil. Yeah, it's it's more of a focus on mechanical and electrical, uh, okay. mainly mechanical, and then there is opportunity for electrical through our physics program. But mechanical is the the primary focus of our engineering program. And are those students able to compete with students from, uh, let's say, Iowa State or the University of Iowa for the same position? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I would say maybe even more so at a certain degree, just because you go to Iowa State, which is probably the, the more predominant engineering program, and you, you're, you're a, a small fish in a very big sea of students. Um, mm -hmm. The same kind of idea with the pre-med program at Iowa. Um, everyone kind of goes there because they know, hey, I know it's a great med school, or hey, I know it's a great engineering school, but I always tell students, that's the master's program you're talking about. And you have to get to that program. You're looking at probably five, six years possibly. And so our students really, in a four-year program, have done a lot in terms of being able to design projects. Um, there's a lot more freedom. You know, the, the, the biggest benefit of our engineering program is we have all this equipment that you get to use. And you don't have to ask anybody. You know, if you're an engineering major, we have three or four 3D printers. And so there's, there's no, you don't have to talk to the professor if you can use it. You just go in there and do it. 
and you design things that way. Or you go into the fabrication lab and you're using drills and saws and all this equipment. And you can do that. You don't have to, to, to have somebody watching over your shoulder and, and making sure you have permission. You just have that opportunity. And while it's a growing program at Cornell, it's also still small, smaller in number than a giant university. So you're not competing with hundreds of students for that equipment. You know, you get that. You have your time and you can do, you know, whatever you'd like. Did any of those students who graduated opt to continue their education in a specialty? Yeah. Um, I don't know specifically about engineering, but in general, about half of our students who graduate go off to complete an advanced degree. Um, Pre-law is a fairly popular program for us. We have a nationally competitive mock trial team. Um, and, and so that's where we get a lot of the students to go off to complete an advanced degree, psychology, pre-law, pre-med. Um, engineering, again, it's fairly early in the cycle there. So we don't, I don't know exactly where the trend is, if whether or not they're going off to complete an advanced degree or, or get a job. But I do know that we've had some students go off to get uh, jobs in engineering right out of graduation. Uh, my last question, is there optimism on campus and within the surrounding community that life will become closer to what it was before the pandemic? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think what's really nice and, and has been nice about the block plan is that we have so much flexibility that, that we get to have. Um, due to the fact that you're only taking one course at a time, we're not having to rearrange entire four class schedules for students or figure out how you're gonna do half of it um, in person or half of it online. Uh, and so, you know, I think our goal is to return to complete normalcy a, as quickly as we possibly can. And I think that is the overall goal. Um, you know, we've been able to keep it as close to normal as we possibly can uh, this semester, bringing students back, having hybrid courses. We have uh, opportunities for visitors to visit on campus uh, for, for new students as well. So we've been able to do that safely and, and keep our guidelines in check there. And so, you know, we're trying to, to keep some vision of, of normal uh, on campus as best we possibly can. But I think our faculty, our staff, our administration, we're all eager to get back to that, that point in time where you can shake hands or you can hug somebody on the quad or you can have lunch with them. And I know that's probably uh, speaking for everybody, but, you know, I think we're, we're eager to get back to that. And I think that we are, we are set to, to do that as soon as we possibly can and, and can guarantee the safety. Drew, thank you for your time today. And I hope that everything returns successfully to what everyone at Cornell likes it to be and likes to see. Thanks, Stuart. I really appreciate the time. And, you know, for, for anybody who's, who, who watches this and, and wants more information, they can definitely reach out to me uh, at any time. And I'm happy to, to answer questions, um, whether it's uh, somebody who is just trying to gather information about Cornell or somebody who uh, has a, a student that they think the, the block plan would be a good fit for them. Um, okay. You know, they can email me or, or, or give me a call and I'm happy to answer any questions they have. Um, what's your email so that they could reach out to you? Absolutely. So my email is dschradel at cornellcollege.edu. So D is a dog and then S-H-R-A-D-E-L at cornellcollege.edu. Drew, thank you again and happy, and happy new year. Thanks, you too, Stuart.